You're listening to Morning Short, the podcast that brings you a great short story two mornings a week. Available on listen.morningshort.com, iTunes, CastBox, and any podcast app you like. Today's story is My Watch by Mark Twain. But before we begin, I want to tell you about CastBox, one of the preferred iOS and Android podcast apps of Morning Short. CastBox has the best listening experience you'll find anywhere. It's been featured by editors worldwide, and it's available for free on iOS and Android. Try CastBox for your next story. And now to our story. An instructive little tale. My beautiful new watch had run 18 months without losing or gaining and without breaking any part of its machinery or stopping. I had come to believe it infallible in its judgments about the time of day and to consider its constitution and its anatomy imperishable. But at last one night I let it run down. I grieved about it as if it were a recognized messenger and forerunner of calamity. But by and by I cheered up, set the watch by guess, and commanded my bodings and superstitions to depart. Next day I stepped into the chief jeweler's to set it by the exact time, and the head of the establishment took it out of my hand and proceeded to set it for me. Then, he said, she is four minutes slow. Regulator wants pushing up. I tried to stop him. Tried to make him understand that the watch kept perfect time. But no, all this human cabbage could see was that the watch was four minutes slow and that the regulator must be pushed up a little. And so, while I danced around him in anguish and implored him to let the watch alone, he calmly and cruelly did the shameful deed. My watch began to gain. It gained faster and faster day by day. Within the week, it sickened to a raging fever, and its pulse went up to a hundred and fifty in the shade. At the end of two months, it had left all the timepieces of the town far in the rear, and was a fraction over thirteen days ahead of the almanac. It was away into November, enjoying the snow, while the October leaves were still turning. It hurried up house rent, bills payable, and such things in such a ruinous way that I could not abide it. I took it to the watchmaker to be regulated. He asked me if I had ever had it repaired. I said no, it had never needed any repairing. He looked a look of vicious happiness and eagerly pried the watch open, and then put a small dice box into his eye and peered into its machinery. He said it wanted cleaning and oiling, besides regulating, come in a week. After being cleaned and oiled and regulated, my watch slowed down to that degree that it ticked like a tolling bell. I began to be left by trains. I failed all appointments. I got to missing my dinner. My watch strung out three days' grace to four and let me go to protest. I gradually drifted back into yesterday, then day before, then into last week, and by and by the comprehension came upon me that all solitary and alone I was lingering along in week before last, and the world was out of sight. I seemed to detect in myself a sort of sneaking fellow feeling for the mummy in the museum, and a desire to swap news with him. I went to a watchmaker again. He took the watch all to pieces while I waited, and then said the barrel was swelled. He said he could reduce it in three days. After this, the watch averaged well, but nothing more. For half a day, it would go like the very mischief and keep up such a barking and wheezing and whooping and sneezing and snorting that I could not hear myself think for the disturbance. And as long as it held out, there was not a watch in the land that stood any chance against it. But the rest of the day would keep on slowing down and fooling along until all the clocks it had left behind caught up again. So at last, at the end of twenty-four hours, it would trot up to the judge's stand, all right and just in time. It would show a fair and square average, and no man could say it had done more or less than its duty. 
But a correct average is only a mild virtue in a watch, and I took this instrument to another watchmaker. He said the king bolt was broken. I said I was glad it was nothing more serious. To tell the plain truth, I had no idea what the king bolt was, but I did not choose to appear ignorant to a stranger. He repaired the king bolt, but what the watch gained in one way, it lost in another. It would run a while, and then stop a while, and then run a while again, and so on, using its own discretion about the intervals. And every time it went off, it kicked back like a musket. I patted my breast for a few days, but finally took the watch to another watchmaker. He picked it all to pieces and turned the ruin over and over under his glass, and then he said there appeared to be something the matter with the hair trigger. He fixed it and gave it a fresh start. It did well now, except that always, at ten minutes to ten, the hands would shut together like a pair of scissors, and from that time forth they would travel together. The oldest man in the world could not make head or tail of the time of day by such a watch, and so I went again to have the thing repaired. This person said that the crystal had got bent, and that the mainspring was not straight. He also remarked that part of the works needed half solen. He made these things all right, and then my timepiece performed unexceptionally, save that now and then, after working along quietly for nearly eight hours, everything inside would let go all of a sudden and begin to buzz like a bee, and the hands would straightway begin to spin round and round so fast that their individuality was lost completely, and they simply seemed a delicate spider's web over the face of the watch. She would reel off the next twenty-four hours in six or seven minutes, and then stop with a bang. I went with heavy heart to one more watchmaker, and looked on while he took her to pieces. Then I prepared to cross-question him rigidly, for this thing was getting serious. The watch had cost two hundred dollars originally, and I seemed to have paid out two or three thousand for repairs. While I waited and looked on, I presently recognized in this watchmaker an old acquaintance, a steamboat engineer of other days, and not a good engineer either. He examined all the parts carefully, just as the other watchmakers had done, and then delivered his verdict with the same confidence of manner. He said, She makes too much steam. You want to hang the monkey wrench on the safety valve. I brained him on the spot and had him buried at my own expense. My Uncle William, now deceased, alas, used to say that a good horse was a good horse until it had run away once, and that a good watch was a good watch until the repairers got a chance at it. And he used to wonder what became of all the unsuccessful tinkers and gunsmiths and shoemakers and engineers and blacksmiths, but nobody could ever tell him. If you enjoyed this story, please let us know. Say hello at facebook.com slash morningshort or reddit.com slash r slash morning short, and give us a like on CastBox. Visit share.morningshort.com to invite your family and friends to listen to stories from Morning Short. Learn more about Morning Short and sign up for our daily emails at morningshort.com.